Uh, I'm happy to introduce uh, Dr. Veronica Smith. Veronica is an associate professor uh, in the Department of Educational Psychology at the University of Alberta, and some of you know her because she's also a UBC grad from the doctoral program here. Uh, she's also a speech-language pathologist, so she wears many, many hats. Which hat are you wearing today? Um, oh, a bit of both. A bit of everything. A bit of a researcher, mm. community-based researcher, yeah. yeah. I'll just I'll tell you a little bit about what I'm going to share with you today. Um, uh, although Pat said I had completed this study, it actually is a work in progress. We have um, completed data, and I'm going to share with you data on about 12 families that went through the project. But we've just finished. Um, uh, a collection on five additional families. So things may change a little bit um, as we add that data to our pool. So we haven't quite completed that. And we're hoping to collect data on another five families that will go through the parent training program this spring. So we have a little ways to go before we're finished with it. Despite that, though, with the urgency to publish, we have actually um, completed two manuscripts on this data, on different pieces of the data, just little slivers of it that have given us um, a little bit of an impression on what we're um, working with here. So I'm just sharing with you the preliminary findings, um, and we've had um, some issues as it relates to collecting data in the community. We've been working with a community partner on this project. And um, I'm just going to speculate with you um, what we've found as it relates to the language development of kids with autism and a parent training programs designed to facilitate that development. So before I begin, though, I wanted to just say a little bit about language development and a little bit about um, language development of children with autism. Uh, these were some of the things that we had considered when we were designing uh, the measures for uh, this study. And one of the things that I did when I was at UBC with Pat, um, I was fortunate to work on a project evaluating um, an early intervention uh, in British Columbia that um, she had been conducting for Ministry of Children and Family Development. And for the most part, um, we were looking at standardized tools that um, would try and capture some of the child changes that um, we thought might be occurring um, as a result of that early intervention project. And we were also looking at a few parent factors um, that, that might have um, co-varied maybe with some of that progress that we were and weren't seeing in the children. Um, so, um, but language development is a really complex uh, system and in fact um, acquiring the system of language is probably about as complex as the system itself and there's loads of controversy still about how we actually acquire language. Um, at its most simple sort of behavioral level we have the kid in the center and there's this input that we can expect um, that the child will hear, just hearing it, and um, an um, output that the child will generate and it's influenced by a parent who interacts with that child. Um, the opportunities that a parent gives to the child um, influence the way the child subsequently responds to the parent. So we have a kind of a transactional um, system as we think about Arnold Samuel, all of our lovely IDP folk <laughs> that are in the room that's kind of cumulative and transformative. So there's lots of these occurrences of parent-child interaction. Um, uh, but there's, there's some ideas about how children develop language that are starting to emerge. And just from the point of view of kids, there's some great work uh, that's being done by people like Patricia Cool and Janet Worker here at UBC that's um, examined some of these very early uh, language development issues, speech perception, and that children are actually engaged in looking in a kind of a statistical way at these patterns of what they're hearing. And they're quite sensitive to pattern detecting, you know, distinguishing sort of regularities and inconsistencies within the language. And that 
input then they're actually acting on in a kind of a systematic way. Um, they also um, Develop. We know quite a bit now about how the vocalizations with <coughs> children develop. There's a um, an SLP who's done a, a ton of work in this area, Kimbrough Aller, and he's really documented beautifully um, just the progression of how sounds develop in in children and. Um, we really understand quite a bit about the frequency, the rate of progression in vocalizations, and we also know that those vocalizations very, very early on are associated with language growth. So more of those vocalizations, it appears, is better for language growth. And it's interesting, there was a, a study recently published by Rhea Paul uh, on the vocalizations of children with ASD and um, she um, found in a group of high-risk infants that kids that had less frequent, less varied, you know, consonant, vowel, that kind of canonical babbling that kids engage in early on, um, those vocal behaviors were later associated with a later diagnosis at 24 months. So there's some kind of early markers that we're seeing with these early vocalizations um, with kitties with autism. Um, but kids uh, with autism and kids developing language, they don't just engage in this statistical learning without any parent input. Um, there's, there are lots of social influences on the input. Uh, Patricia Kuhl describes this social input, uh, the language as being sort of socially gated. She. Um, had a really intriguing study that she shared um, at probably every conference I've been to in the last decade, no, five years at least, um, I think it was in 2003, where she exposed these children, uh, uh, English um, children, they were nine months old, to Mandarin, and she found, uh, she exposed them to Mandarin in three different conditions, just an audio recording, a TV recording, and a human Mandarin live speaker. And what she found is, is that these nine-month infants, the only ones who actually learned this, the language, the Mandarin, were those that were exposed to the human speaker. So really deriving this idea that not only do kids get input that they act on in the statistical manner, but they also, it's, it, it's gated by this social interaction. And that's actually been um, beautifully um, expanded on in other aspects of the literature by people like um, Bakeman and Adamson, Tomasello, who have noted that not only is it socially gated, but there's lots of things that parents do that make it more likely that kids will attend to this input. So the highly um, affective, um, uh, um, highly contingent responses that parents give to their children um, increase the likelihood that they'll attend to this input. And the same has been found for individuals with autism. In um, 2008, uh, Siller and Sigmund published a study that demonstrated that parents who were more responsive to their children's attention and activity during play, that predicted their language skills two years later, uh, at, actually at nine years later. Um, so, so that kind of social gating of language is something that's really very important. Um, also, what happens in the system of language learning is that the, these vocalizations that kids make, um, they actually um, uh, are able to kind of influence the way that their children respond to them. There's some intriguing work by um, Gold, um, uh, Steen and others that have looked at the non-cry signals of um, infants and parents apparently respond to, to about 30 to 50 percent of these non-cry signals. Um, and um, But p infants actually um, use these signals to their parents in a way that um, has to do with the way their parents respond. So they had this kind of nifty study where they gave their, the parents, um, or the parents had to 
uh, have a, a still face paradigm, so they um, looked like they weren't responding to their children. And what they found very predictably from these infants was this extinction burst. So the kids go, blah, 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 blah. They, they actually want give more vocalization if their parent gives them this still face. So it's like they are going to give them more vocalization. So there's an interaction in this system. And the kids actually who had a greater extinction burst, um, Goldstein found those were children actually that um, had greater language growth when they looked at them when they were three years old. So you see how this sort of language system, there's lots of social influences, even on behalf of the parents and on behalf of these developing infants. So we see that it's really a very social system. And um, actually that um, child behavior Ha, uh, in terms of influencing the parent has been seen to, uh, well, kind of was suggested by Paul Yoder and, um, and his people down in Vanderbilt. He noticed that um, kids uh, decreased um, their uh, frequency of initiating... Um, sorry, that there was a decreased frequency of children with ASD to initiate and engage, and he just hypothesized that that might impact the parent's ability to sort of map where their kid was at in terms of their language development. And so that could um, get the, th those transactions out of time, um, uh, and there would be, they would be less timely and um, less meaningful for both partners. So he was just hypothesizing about that in 99. I think he would be more definitive about that now a decade later. Um, um, but there's other factors in this complex system. Um, th at the macro level, there's things like um, uh, socioeconomic status, um, the cognitive factors that are within the child, hearing are factors, home environment, all of these things really seem to influence this language system. In terms of the SES, one of the really significant studies that um, started off this um, discussion about influence of parents and children um, and their language development was published by Hart and Risley in 1995. This was a momentous event for all speech language pathologists in the world because it really demonstrated that the amount that ch uh, parents talk to their children impacts their language development. And um, he, they demonstrated that um, parents that were college educated spoke to their children three times more than families that were receiving welfare and that had an impact on language development and IQ at three years of age. Um, and again here's the Siller and um, uh, Sigmund study that demonstrated these highly responsive parents um, were you would see um, greater um, uh, language development at nine years for kids with autism. Um, okay, so we know that children appear to benefit from both quality interactions of a certain quality, but we really don't know the components of this system, like how much, how much of the quality at what time. Like we, there's lots of uncertainties in this system. So we have yet to kind of. Um, compute the sort of the strength of the relationships in, in this system. Um, but despite the uncertainty of um, what drives the development, a lot of attention has focused on the contribution of, that parents play in language development. And we really need measures that look at both the quantity and the quality of the actual input that parents engage in. So we have good ideas of risk, predictive factors for kids with ASD, and I think that we look as interventionists to change the environment in a way that's probably going to have the biggest bang for the buck. So we're going to focus probably on those, um, the input and parent training programs are kind of a natural way of addressing some of that. 
So what we were interested in um, in this um, study was to examine the effect of the More Than Words Parent Training Program. It's a widely implemented program in Canada and the U.S. and many parts of the world. Um, and we wanted to measure change in a way that would capture both the quality and quantity of the inputs and outputs. So um, in this study, we um, want to look at the base rates of um, communication in it, that the children were receiving and we wanted to document the fidelity of the imp implementation of the program and then to look to see if there were any changes in both parent and child language um, as a result of the program. So um, a tool that we um, were quite intrigued to use in, at the beginning of this study was the language um, uh, environmental analysis system. I wonder if many of you have heard of this gizmo. Um, it is a um, like a little iPod, but not an iPod. <laughs> um, it's a little device that is about the size of an iPod that uh, children wear in a piece of clothing and we're, you're able to record um, for a long period of time what's going on in the child's day from the moment he gets up till the moment he goes to bed. And um, there is um, uh, a software program that the developers of this device um, uh, have um, have developed to um, analyze the uh, vocal signal to come up with estimates of child vocalizations, adult words, and conversational turns in the environment. The impetus for this, the development of this program, was Hart and Risley's work, which uh, demonstrated the importance of what's going on in the household, but we really haven't had a very good way of measuring this that anyone, any sane researcher could afford. Um, it's Hart and Risley's work, which actually was just documenting only 30 children, or 33 children, I think, um, from ages uh, um, 24 months to 36 months, they took six years to transcribe the um, home language environment that they collected over that period of time. And there were over, um, hey Karen, um, there were over 30,000 pages of transcription. So who, who's worked on a research study <laughs> that wants to engage in that kind of work? No one. So, um, uh, so this, this Lena device is a way of automatically yeah. estimating vocalizations. So what we know about the way individuals communicate is that there are um, vocal patterns that are quite consistent. The, the, the shape, the frequency of a consonant is different than that of a vowel. Um, and um, we're able to make these estimations by analyzing the vocal frequency. So. So this, this tool was developed in about two, well, it's been under development for a couple of years. Um, and I, I think I encountered um, it at a Society for Research and Child Development conference and spoke with some of the folk, maybe it was with you, Karen, we were at, an, it was at an American Speech and Hearing conference. And um, uh, I was really intrigued with it. Um, because I love this idea of capturing all of this very, very rich data um, and understanding really what was going on in households. And I thought it would be a great tool to use to understand the impact of a parent training program um, because mostly what we understand about the impact of parent training program is derived from kind of laboratory measures, you know, the kind of standardized tools or maybe a video that would actually capture um, the ability of the parents to interact, but we're really just capturing these sort of little snippets of what's going on in the environment. 
And I thought that <laughs> we might be able to use this tool to actually capture more of what's going on in the child's day and if we got some good pre-test measures and understood a little bit about what's the natural state of this language environment, we might see if the parent training program had any impact on that. And even to begin with, what is the natural state of the child's language learning environment? So what you can see here, if you can't see my head <laughs> in the middle of it, um, is just a, one of the types of data that you can get from this tool. These are child vocalizations, and the tool was put on um, the DLP, Digital Language Processor, was um, put on the child at 7 in the morning, and he went to bed about 9 p.m. And you can see that he tended to vocalize more, maybe around breakfast, and after Dad got home and horsed around with him, or something like that. Um, uh, but you can see probably here, he, um, he might have had a nap in the middle of the day. Um, and you get a, r a real sense of the amount of vocalizations that occurred over the course of the day for that kitty. The same is uh, you can capture on adult vocalizations. So because my frequency of vocalization is different from the only guy in the room's frequency of vocalization. Here, let me hear you talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and, and even, uh, but it's different. A child's frequency is different from an adult female and an adult male. This digital language processor is able to determine that even the male and the female adult um, input. So here we have um, all the adult words, but I can actually ask the processor to divide it up between the male and the female so I could know if it was mom or dad doing the talking. Can you get also the, the recording of the conversation? Yeah, so actually at the top level, this is the cheap and nasty level, which actually was probably the very expensive to develop level, um, but underneath that you have an actual um, Recording, So there is an actual audio recording. It's just that this, it's being processed using algorithms to estimate what, how many words are, are, um, are being spoken. Um, and it's not actually words in the sense of the children. Those are just vocalizations because many children, as they're developing language, they have loads of vocalizations. And so it can even distinguish between um, those kind of eating vocalizations and crying vocalizations and the ones that we're really interested in that are more related to speech and language development. Um, so... Uh, you can see here, and this is sort of mapped on that the adult words corresponds quite a bit with those child vocalizations, um, which is what we're kind of hoping for often. And a really interesting piece, and the one that has been kind of most highly associated with the language development is this conversational turns. So what's the frequency of when it goes back and forth? And actually there's types of analysis that you can do that actually look at who initiates that conversational turn. So is it the, the vocalization from the child or the vocalization from the adult? Um, that is a uh, a type of analysis though that we have just started to do with, with our data set. So I was saying I'm not finished yet. <laughs> um, you get a load of data. So here you can get sort of a composite view. One of the kind of interesting pieces of this is that it also can filter out TV. So you really get a good sense of how much TV viewing is going or electronic noise that there is in the environment because that has a different frequency than other vocalizations. Um, but you can really see that there's some parallels with this composite view of what's going on with the adult, the conversational turns, and the child vocalizations, which we're really quite interested in when we implement these parent training programs because that's what we'd like to see probably a little bit more of. Um, so um, the Lena Foundation has actually done a lot of um, norming and testing out of this tool, and they have developed um, uh, from a study of 329 families where they have 
collected um, in-home data from them over a, a long period of time. Um, what's normal, what's normal in the uh, home environment, the home language environments of kids. So what you can see from this chart from age 2 to 36 months is that child vocalizations gradually increase over that time period as do conversational turns. Um, but um, adult um, words really stay more or less consistent. It's kind of a, a normal buzz in the household in terms of those adult words. Um, uh, okay. Oh, at, in 2010, Steve Warren and his group um, used this device to look at what's going on in the households of kids with ASD and were they different from typically developing children. Um, he found, uh, I, th I think this was a piece that was published in JAD, that kids were talking less and were engaging significantly less in conversational terms over the day, um, which is what you might expect from what we understand about um, language development of kids with ASD. Um, but he found that the um, adult words in that environment was roughly equivalent to what we'd find in um, um, typically developing children's households. The thing is, though, with Warren's study, um, there were often um, typically developing um, children in the household, um, and he his um, sample, his comparison was to um, children that were the same chronological age, not the same developmental age. And um, so I had a few criticisms with what he was up to, but really it was just uh, kind of a springboard to think about how we might use this normative data a little bit differently. So that was one of the tools that we used to collect uh, some data on the impact of the parent training program. We used the LENA um, pre, um, mid, post, and two months follow-up. And we wanted to look at just kind of the basic level, although we have a couple of other analyses um, going on at adult words, child vocalizations, conversational turns. Um, we also um, use the MacArthur um, uh, Communicative Developmental Inventories to look at pre, post, and follow-up um, receptive and expressive language and use of gestures. And we also... Um, wanted to look at the quality of the um, parent-child interaction. So we used videotape that was taken um, by the speech-language pathologist who implemented the program and coded it using Bakeman and Adamson's engagement states to look at um, the amount of coordinated joint attention, unengaged um, uh, attention uh, on uh, objects, those kinds of codes were um, ones that we used. So the first couple here, the LENA and the MCDI, were really more of our quantitative measures, and this dyadic interaction, um, the quality of that interaction, we um, looked at from the uh, videotapes. Um, so who... Um, came into our study. Um, we have been slowly collecting this data. Um, unlike many of the large funded studies in the U.S. that have millions of dollars, this was, uh, well, not quite a shoestring budget, but um, we were also cooperating with a service provider in order to collect this data. So what they do is they offer two Hannon programs a year, one in the spring and one in the fall. And so we invite families that participate in that to participate in our study. Um, it's, and this is data from two of those um, offerings of the More Than Words program. Um, the kids were chronologically aged 28 to 39 months, and their, but their developmental age, their mean developmental age was only nine months. And... Um, there were eight males, four females, and we had a, quite a mix of ethnicity um, in the group um, with four of the families having English as a second language. So that's quite a bit out of 12. Um, 
and uh, primary caregiver was um, majority of them were mothers, and um, there were siblings in the home as well. So the, the children, the development age, they were about two to three years delayed at the time that they participated in this study. Um, the service provider was interested in a couple of things. They wanted to know, because we were in cooperation with them in this study, they wanted to know if the skills were learned and if they were transferred to the home. And they also were really concerned about these um, second language learners. They wanted to know if this program, the More Than Words program, had as much of an impact with those families and what were the kinds of supports additionally that they might need. Um, so. Um, there are a number of uh, parent training programs, and uh, we know there's a couple actually that have been published recently um, in the area of autism, um, a couple of new publications actually, one on the Han and More Than Words, um, and we know a bit about their effect um, and their lack of effectiveness in some regard, or their effect with some children and not with others, but things that we know a little bit less about um, are um, whether or not how able are the parents uh, to learn the skills that are taught and how able are they to, able to use them in their natural environments. And um, we also uh, know a little bit less about uh, some of the aspects of fidelity of those programs. So more than words is a, um, the parents receive eight 2.5 hour um, sessions weekly and they get three one and a half hour home visits with a speech language pathologist. Um, that one at uh, the, the sort of the beginning of the program, one midway through and one towards the end of the program. It is implemented by speech language pathologists who have been trained by, um, by the Hannon Center in Toronto, although that, those trainings occur all around the world, I'm sure in Vancouver. Um, it's based on social interactionist theory, so some of those models of language development. Um, and there's three objectives. They want to, um, first off, they want to educate the parents about um, language development and have the parents understand more about how their child is developing and what stage of language they're at. And then they teach them um, ways to interact with their child um, to facilitate their language development. But also a third goal of the Hannon program is to um, support, to provide a sort of a social support for parents. So many of the programs for um, the parent training programs are individual. They're not group-based. These parents come together in a group to learn about these skills and they only have three one-to-one -one sessions. Some of the other parent training programs are more one-to-one -one focused. Um, okay. There are a couple of empirical studies that uh, demonstrate some effect of the More Than Words program. Um, they've seen, for example, positive effects in um, the parent behaviors and some positive change in regard to the children. Um, there is a, a recent publication of an RCT, but I'll talk about some of the effects that they had a little bit later. Um, so we did look at, um, in this study, the implementation fidelity. We were interested in parent attendance in a, um, a real-world setting. And we also wanted both the parents and the clinicians to rate the skills, their, um, their skills, how effective they were in terms of how well could they identify their child's stage of communication, how well could they implement these skills, in which context they teach skills um, so that parents can engage in people games, songs, books, toy play. Um, and they, we also asked them two months after the program had ended how well they were able to maintain the skills that they had learned. 
So what did we find? Well, first off, we were really interested in this base um, level of um, communication frequency um, uh, in the home. So on the vertical axis, you can see the hourly adult words ranged from um, over 500 to just over 1,300 um, per hour. And um, th when in the LENA normative data, um, the for 50th percentile um, for typically developing children, they noted that it was about 1,025 words per hour. So our, when we compare our families, we have quite a range of talk. We have families um, who uh, had frequencies around the 10th percentile compared to the normative group, all the way up to about the 70th percentile, with a mean frequency of really just below that 50th percentile. It's actually about the 40th percentile for the families of kids in our study. Um, these two graphs um, represent the um, child vocalizations and conversational turns. And the child vocalizations ranged from about um, roughly 60 to about 270 per hour with a mean of 134 per hour. And this, this, um, this represents kids, the majority of our children are producing vocalizations Com contrasted to typical peers at about the 35th percentile. In terms of conversational turns, um, our families were, compared to the norm, were operating at about the 30th percentile. So like the Warren study, we found that these two were below um, the 50th percentile for the majority of our kitties. That's at baseline, right? At baseline. This is based on their age? To actually, yeah, that's actually a great question. It's it's based on um, their developmental age, but um, uh, uh, it's a little bit problematic just using the norms for developmental age. So um, uh, because there's some statistical problems with that. So what we would like to do is, and we've asked the Lena Foundation for a matched sample. So we're going to have a three to one matched sample, which is going to help us a little bit um, rather than using this normative data. Um, so we're looking to get some matching, some better matching, and we'll be able to match off a couple of demographic factors as well um, because using the norms is a little bit problematic. But yes, we use developmental age here, that nine-month window. The average. Yeah, average. yeah. Um, not chronological age. Um, okay, so I think I did that one, yes. Yes. Um, so we found actually, um, like uh, the Warren study, um, we found huge variability. Actually, like the Lena Normative study, actually, there's huge variability in the amount that people talk at, in their households. Some people don't talk at all, um, or they talk very little. And some people, there's much more active communication with their children. Did you look at correlations with SES? We, we sure did. Yeah. And um, I'll get to that. Oh, okay. um, remember, we only have 12 kids. <laughs> um, we did find a few correlations, but actually not there. I'll, I'll, um, so, but we did find, actually, in contrast to Warren's work, that our parents were talking less um, than the, the toddlers in the, uh, the typical sample. So... Um, and we have some possible explanations for that. So were the parents able to learn the more than word skills? Well, one of the things that we encountered was that um, attendance varied considerably. We Eight of the 12 parents um, came to all and only missed one. Uh, eight of the 12 families, I should say, um, uh, came to all or only missed one session. Two. Um, of the families missed four sessions, so that's one um, half of all of the sessions, and um, one um, um, 
mm, that doesn't seem right. Oh, I must have said that twice. Um, and there was one parent that only, um, mm, I don't know why I said that, four. Do those four sessions include the, um, the No, actually all of the families participated in the one-to-one -one coaching. Oh, okay every single one of them, um, which is interesting, but some of them didn't come to those evening group sessions. Yeah. So there was a range of um, uh, attendance with four of the families. So essentially, of the 12, about a third of them would really have low dosage in terms of that group training. Um, but the caregivers, when we gave them that questionnaire, they did um, feel that they had made some progress. And this was across all of the families. It moved from about sometimes using the skills to frequently using the skills. Um, but very few of them actually said consistently using the skills. The clinician ratings, though, were a little bit less encouraging. They actually, on average, rated that only 55% of the skills from their observations from the final um, uh, meeting with the parents were used consistently. So, um, and that actually varies quite a bit from some of the published work in this area. Um, uh, for example, there's a, a couple of PRT studies. One was a 15-hour intervention. It was a one-to-one -one intervention um, that was published in 2010 by um, Mignares and uh, Williams and Mercy and Hardin, and they re reported 50% parent, excuse me, 80% fidelity. Um, there was a, a publication from some work uh, in Nova Scotia um, of eight kids um, that were in the PRT, um, and they reported a range of about 70 to 100% um, uh, parent fidelity. And um, a joint attention intervention by Connie Cassery's group, and she reported about 80% parent fidelity. So that's a little bit of a concern in terms of what the clinician is reporting in terms of um, uh, parent fidelity, and it may call into question some of the intensity and a density of the more than words um, training. Right, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's, that's a piece, actually, that I think is quite important. Um, I don't think we really know at all how much the parents are using the skills in... But this is their rating on how much they think they're using. Right? That, uh, how much they were able to demonstrate skill use when they were in the presence of whoever was doing the rating. Yeah, so that's all we know from any of the data um, that we are seeing in, with families um, from any of the studies. But it is interesting that they are reporting better fidelity. And yes, does it? They they do see them more. So yeah, do the is that um, because uh, although they're not really seeing them more actually um, in the. Um, in the work in Nova Scotia from that uh, Kulikan Smith Bryson, they only saw their families for six hours in total. Three, yes, an hour and a half more. I mean, it's not that much more in that study. So um, it's a very short intervention as well. Um, so to what degree do, did the more than words then um, influence the um, frequency of communicative interactions? We looked at the LENA data as well, um, and we also looked at the child engagement states videotaped um, data. And um, we also looked at a little bit of this kind of differential response to the program. So we looked at some of the family profiles because not all of the families responded in the same way to the program. Um, with the video data, um, three of the ten children showed decreases in being unengaged. Nine of ten of the children, um, and I, I apologize, we only, um, I meant to say we only have data, video data on ten of the twelve children. Um, so nine of the ten kids showed um, a decrease in object-focused 
intervals, which is a good thing for kids with ASD. We want to see less of that. Um, uh, and it was the definition of this object focus was object focus in, and no focus on the caregiver or that person that was interacting with them. And seven of the kids showed an increase in their coordinated joint attention. So that was really positive from um, pre to post. In terms of the LENA data, um, this graph um, depicts the hourly word count at four different time points. So the um, uh, baseline, mid, post, and follow-up. And um, overall, what you can see is an increase in um, the um, adult words per hour by the end of the program. However, two months later, when we went into the family's home, for the most part, um, this, this um, increase had gone back down to baseline levels. And so what we weren't able to find, even with a very simple t-test, was a statistical difference between um, the baseline to um, uh, post-test. And that's mainly because of A, the small sample size, and B, um, the variability. There's great variability, but we, what we can see generally from this data is um, a lack of ability to maintain some of that um, uh, increased talk time at home. And when you look across the families, um, it is important to look at this individual response to the program, just at pre and post. Um, uh, seven of the families at the pre were actually below the 50th percentile and um, two of the families were below the 20th, um, which is was equivalent actually to um, Hart and Risley's um, uh, words per hour for families on welfare, so for the families that were speaking the lowest in their data set. Um, but post-intervention, in even though there was only a percentile change of about nine points, um, three of the families did move up to the 80th percentile in terms of the amount of words they were using in their households. And those four of seven that were below the 50th percentile, they moved to at the 50th percentile. So we did see a lot of change in the amount of adult words immediately post-program. Um, program. That's a, that's a perfect question, Karen, because that's the only significant thing that we found, actually. Yes, there was. So what we found is, um, and the, um, is that the families, there was a, a correlation between um, second language in the household and the amount of progress that the children made. Yeah. Not in the amount of words that were used in the home, though. By the yeah, by the adults. But we did see a correlation between second language in the home and um, all of the child outcome measures, all of them, as a matter of fact, yeah. Were, they, were the adult words in both languages? Uh, yes, they were. You yeah. can differentiate between the languages. Well, uh, we can't. You can't with the Yes, we can if we do that 30,000 pages of transcription. <laughs> um, but... Uh, and you just know how much they talk, know what language they were talking. That's about right. And yeah, and actually, that's an interesting feature, though, of the Lena is that you can actually um, get some good understanding of the amount of talk in households that are um, using another language too, which we wouldn't be able to do um, uh, without a lot of resources. We did see on those that parent report measure of the. Um, uh, communicative developmental inventories increases for all of the kids in um, the gestures, the receptive and expressive language. However, as you probably noticed, we don't have a comparison group here, so we can't actually claim that any of that had to do with um, the parent training program. 
So um, what we do get a sense of, though, from this data is that um, there were qualitative changes in the dyadic interaction between the parents and their children. We did see some really good um, changes in engagement states um, at, for in some way or other for nine of the ten families that we had good video data on. And we found quantitative changes um, in the fidelity, how much parents felt they were able to use these skills um, from before the hand and more than words to after. And we found language growth in the children. Um, we found that there was more adult words in the home, not maintained though at post-test, and more conversational turns in the households as well at post-test. But it wasn't what we were really, um, it wasn't consistent, these changes across the family. So we wanted to look at where there were, um, where there was this kind of uh, child change and parent change. And what we found were that there were, for the dozen families that we had in this, we found positive changes with the parents and positive changes with the children in um, about 50% of the children that are the families that participated. But we did get some other profiles as well where we had no change in um, the parents um, but the child went up. So that's one of those dandelion kids that Tom Boyce talks about. You know, he's going to grow despite the, um, what the dirt's like. Um, and, uh, and here, though, we found um, no parent change and no child change. And here, um, um, parent up, but no child change with three of the families. Um, one of the things about this group of children is that at the beginning of the study, eight of them were non, functionally nonverbal, and at the end of the study, six of them remained um, uh, nonverbal. And when, so when we are describing these families here, there actually are, uh, I believe there are two children in this group that are still nonverbal, but the um, the parent-child interaction, there was more dyadic engagement, no, more coordinated joint attention with that group of kids. Um, so it wasn't words per se. So we get um, some increases for about 50% of the families, but um, a, a, a variation of um, change with the, uh, and no change with some of the other families. So um, we still are uh, um, maybe not all that much closer to um, better understanding which, uh, with this data, um, which of those children um, uh, and which families actually um, should have which treatments. Um, uh, we know that it worked for some of the families, um, but not all of them. Um, so um, there was a little bit of a relationship with the language learning. We did find that second language learning in the home or second language in the home significantly was associated with the coordinated joint attention and the MCDI. We had lower skills with those families. Um, and at um, the micro level of the child, we found that there was less progress with the nonverbal kids and um, that developmental age was associated with um, the parent change on the uh, MacArthur, um, parent reported change on the MacArthur and with the um, uh, conversational turns and the child vocalizations. In the four families who had English as a second language, these were also um, children who remain nonverbal and were difficult to engage in this particular sample. So it just sort of shows you small samples can um, possibly skew your data in some regard. Um, um, so what we found actually was different from that recent, a recently published study by um, Alice Carter and a number of individuals in the U.S. on the More Than Words program. They actually found it, um, that the children that had lower object orientation did better 
in the More Than Words program. So, which is, is and theirs was a randomized control trial um, which indicates that the kids that are playing less with toys and have less of an interest in toys, um, that seem, they seem to do better in the program than the kids that came into the program that were more able and more able to play with toys. Um, and uh, so we are actually going to look at our MCDI data, but quite frankly, I don't think we have a, a large enough um, sample at this point to um, make any um, statements in that regard. Um, however, they, I think they had about 30 kids in their sample, I think. Um, so we have um, here our findings are limited maintenance of the parent talk gains, some changes in the coordinated joint attention and receptive language, different patterns of adult and child change, and large variability between the families. Um, this data really represents only one speech language pathologist implementation of the program in the subsequent um, programs where we're collecting data, we have a different SLP that's delivering the program and we're interested in that because we, we do want to see that there's some sort of external, if there is any external validity to this program and that, that it's durable across um, different types of SLPs. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pause there and I think it's a good time to pause. Um, I just want to tell you though, because data is endless, <laughs> we did actually do a qualitative study um, where we ha invited one family um, from each of those four quadrants in and um, we asked them about their experience in the More Than Words program because we wanted to know a little bit about um, and the service provider wanted to know a little bit about um, how the parents um, felt about their experiences and what they felt were the challenges and benefits of engaging in this program um, as a family that was recently, recently had received a diagnosis of autism. Um, but I'm just going to pause there and see if there are any questions and um, thoughts. What did they say? Oh, oh, <laughs> well, I can tell you quickly. Okay, so we, we asked, uh, we had six themes. Um, the parents said that they thought the uh, More Than Words was a good starting point, but what they really wanted, and this came out very loud and clear, is they needed very clear expectations of what they felt they could expect um, in terms of their responsibilities in implementing the program and what they could expect in terms of expectations for their child change. Um, uh, and those are a couple of quotes from some of the families. They wanted clear expectations and they thought that maybe these groups, if, the, if Hannon was going to be conducted in groups, should be subgrouped by perhaps maybe levels of the child's ability. So maybe for those early communicator kids, those kids that were really just starting out, maybe those parents should be grouped together because some of their concerns and issues were more similar. They also really wanted uh, follow-up visits um, because if they were going to learn this ginormous set of skills, and there's a lot of them, there are 16 separate skills that are taught over these eight sessions that the parents have to learn. That's a big uptake of, of um, t uh, things to learn in the program. They wanted some follow-up because what they were noticing is as their children were progressing, um, they weren't really able to know when to apply some of these skills as their kids were changing. Um, another theme that came up from the um, focus groups were, were that the parents described that they had what they felt were unique emotional and informational needs um, that really at the beginning of the program were really barriers to um, learning about some of these skills. So they wanted more time to, and these are families that have just received, I mean they, they were one day in the Glen Rose and the next day they were headed to the, um, 
the service provider, but they needed um, more time to discuss emotions around the diagnosis. And they also felt um, that they needed more information about ASD in general and what they could expect across the lifespan. Um, theme three, um, and this was a grandmother who was the, one of the mums who participated. Um, sh there was a sense that more individualized one-to-one -one modeling in vivo feedback, they needed, they, it, um, th that, they, it mitigated, that feedback really mitigated the overwhelming content. They felt always a lot better when the speech pathologist came. They knew what to do with the information in those coaching sessions. So more one-to-one -one coaching was a recommendation that came from that. And this was the Studley guy who participated. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, not really. Um, <laughs> um, but there was a uh, p perceived that their learning and behavior change was reliant on child factors. So where their kid was at really seemed to have a um, make a difference with um, how um, much they were able to apply the skills. Um, and uh, it's interesting, this is the Carter finding really was that um, the children with low object orientation, the, um, the, the more than words had a greater facilitative effect. So maybe it, um, it points to uh, that some interventions are more appropriate for some um, and, uh, families than others, I think. Theme five was that uh, it was a real positive that the program provided a venue for parent-to-parent -parent support, which seemed like a really essential thing. A lot of the parents, and when you read these satisfaction surveys, they're very positive about um, the program, and it was really motivating for the parents to hear the other families describe how they were trying out these skills. So in fact, in that way, it served a purpose that maybe some of these individualized programs don't serve. And really, that is one of the goals of the um, Hannon program. So they wanted more parent-to-parent -parent time, um, more time allotted in those groups to discuss the successes and challenges. And even actually one of the families said um, that, you know, they kind of, they did like the, the More Than Words videos. And I don't know if any of you have seen them. They're quite good. And as a, uh, an instructor, you feel... I'm, I'm quite happy to have those kind of videos at my disposal, but the families, they preferred seeing the videos that had been taken in the family's home of the other kids in the room. They wanted those videos. They wanted to see John's kid, and they wanted to see Owen, because they knew about those kids, and they cared about them. They didn't really care about the sample videos. So I thought that was kind of an interesting um, comment that made by one of the parents. Um, uh, and really, we had lots of dad participation in both of these um, implementations of the Hannon program. And they, and they were, for the most part, um, the, the working parent or the parent that was out of the home. And they wanted to, they felt that they had some unique learning needs that really weren't being addressed given the scheduling of the program. So they wanted to think about maybe time of day, maybe a weekend implementation of the program, a Saturday, um, and maybe a support group for dads. That was another thing that came up from one of the fathers that participated. And, and I think the unique learning needs of families, I was just at the Society for Research and Child Development conference last week, and um, Alice Carter, who's looking at her more than words data set, noted that um, there really was a moderating effect of depression and really a cost to the parent if they came in stressed and depressed they still learned the skills like the other parents, but their stress just went off the Richter scale. So we really have to think about some of those depression um, and stress issues as it relates to families. So that support group piece, making it really ultra convenient for families and not just for the um, um, interventionists that are intervening for the families. Well, plus dads, not to be sexist here, but dads, do interact differently with their kids yeah. than moms do. Mm -hmm. And more than words is very much geared to mom interaction. I mean, it's very... Mm -hmm. 
It's you very, mm -hmm. let's, let's read a book now, honey. Let's play with, let's sing a song. That's not how dads do it very often, right? Well, uh, you know what? In the toy play, actually, I do think they address some, some dad-type play situations. Yeah, but it's... But, it's minor compared to the overall emphasis. That's and, the, the target yeah. group very much is mothers. Home. Yeah. So we uh, we're um, going to collect a few more kids um, and. Um, we are looking, one of the interesting things about the Lena data is we have four cases in the group who are actually daycare preschool kids too and we have captured some quite interesting data about the differences in adult word count particularly across a kid's day when they attend daycare and preschool mm -hmm. and then they go home. Some, some scary differences actually. Mm -hmm. Mm. Um, I'm not sure if these children in, in, in your 12 families had other siblings. They did. Um, 11 of them actually had siblings. And did you, I guess you didn't monitor that, or can you give any ideas of what the influence was um, on You know, at this point we haven't looked at it. It is a great question, and um, uh, we are able to... Um, look at that with that vocal frequency we can determine when it's an other child um, we can only figure out other child though not if it's a sibling um, uh, but yeah we don't know about that yet with this data and my second question was simply did you um, match SES for your 12 families or just because there's a lot of variability in the families in yeah the well, there's really no matching of any okay. kind at this point um, all we did was look at the normative data um, that the Lena Foundation has published, but we intend to match on SES and a number of other demographic factors um, as best we can with their larger data set. Um, I guess I meant within the 12 families, were they all similar SES? No. Not in terms of the normative data? No, no, they weren't. They, were, they uh, varied from um, PhD to um, uh, uh, single mom that's um, uh, living with her mother. So, yeah, it varied considerably. And to new new Canadian, new Canadian families. The four families that you said were had ESL right. in the home, did they, was their English good enough that they didn't need any interpreters with them in the sessions? Or mm, That's a good question. Um, yes, it was, I would say... Um, that it was good enough. Um, it's interesting that that um, second language, well, mm, it varied actually. Um, there were two um, um, uh, professional couples that had, like the, um, the family with Urdu, uh, uh, the, the dad worked at the university, for example. So there were, they were some highly educated people in that second language group. No, they actually often spoke um, their first language in the home. And th that, I was, that I was going to ask, when they were encouraged to talk more to their kids through more than words, were they encouraged to specifically talk mm -hmm. more English or more anything or more Urdu, for example, more, more yeah. non-English? Yeah. I think that the recommendation that comes from most SLPs in this regard is um, for a, a child to get a complete language system. So I imagine that they were probably speaking in Urdu or what the, what the home language was. It would be interesting to know that. Yeah. Because, yeah, I, I actually, uh, there is still a huge tendency here in BC for SLPs to tell families to stop speaking the second language mm. because of some outdated notion of mm. Mm -hmm. how it's going to in negatively impact the kids' language development. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't think that you would want to want, I mean, it may be that that clinician wouldn't have done that, but it would be certainly interesting to know that. To know yeah. whether, because you can't differentiate, of course, what language they're speaking from the Lena sample, but. Oh, yes, we can. Oh, we, we can. We can listen, and we did listen to um, the audio. Oh, to the audio. Yeah, you can listen to the audio. Right. And yes, all of those kids that had, um, they, they had a significant amount of what they were hearing was their first, their first, first language. language. Yeah, yeah. Okay.
that's interesting. Mm -hmm. That subgroup, though, is a really interesting group, and we're interested in looking at that data just the pretest data, um, because I don't think we have a really good idea of a lot of what's going on in the households of kids with autism in general, but certainly not when they have um, other right. uh, second language. Uh, I'm, I have a master's student. You're all welcome to come to the thesis defense next week. I'll send that on the Circa listserv, who just finished a study looking at 20 bilingual exposed and 40 monolingual exposed young kids with autism and early language development using a whole variety of measures, seven different dependent variables, mm -hmm. including things like age of first words, CBI, preschool language scale, you know, and really was looking to see if, and, um, and the, the kids were well matched, very well matched for chronological age and nonverbal IQ, and she also co-varied for uh, SLP and ABA intervention hours to wow. wash that out. And she found absolutely no differences between the bilingually exposed and the monolingually exposed kids. Wow, wow. Um, I mean, it's a decent sample size, yeah. 60 kids altogether, right? Yeah. And no difference at all. And, and yet, 40% of the bilingual exposed families had been told by someone, a physician or a speech language pathologist, to speak to stop English. Speaking their yeah. second, their, their yeah. first language to the kid mm -hmm. and only speak English or French. Some of the kids were from Quebec. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, it's really kind of, yeah. you know, it's, I think that's a really interesting it is. group of families. And I don't think uh, there are now three or four studies, or recent studies that I know of, not all published yet looking at this issue of bilingual language development, mm -hmm. and none of them have found that there's a detriment mm -hmm. to being in a bilingual household, and yet mm -hmm. families continue to be advised to, to shut up, essentially. Yeah. Well, to use bro I mean, what it amounts to is to use broken English with their kids. Yeah. Because if, that, if English isn't the first language, then... Yeah. And it really doesn't fit with what we understand about language learning. That kind of that yeah, that kind of statistical ability to kind of look for patterns in the language. You want a child, yeah, to get uh, input in one language that he's able to look for patterns in one language. But that kind of mapping that kids do, that computational you know, ability. Anyway, the reality is. Most immigrant families, they don't speak one language. They, they're, they're always speaking a mix. Mm. And I think that's the other piece. Is, is, mm. is, it's not going to be one language. Mm. It's going to be two languages that mm -hmm. they're exposed to. So the mm -hmm. real question is, especially for an immigrant family, is is exposure to two languages as opposed to the mother tongue better than um, English mm -hmm. or mother tongue? Because mm -hmm. that's what's, what's really going to happen. Yeah. Um, there... Likely, though, they are actually really mostly exposed to the mother tongue. Mm -hmm. Depending on the ages. It depends, yeah. it depends on the true. kids. In our, in our 20 kids, you could just see it change. Yeah. When, when they, they got, got older. It was mostly the mother language. Yeah. Yeah. To one, one to two. Then they're diagnosed at some point and It, 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 depends it on changed. On when Developmental. How mm. they are in so, Canada. Mm -hmm. level it's, it's, yeah, it's, there are it's, lots it's, of factors. Yeah, mm -hmm. and sometimes the family, some of our families weren't told to switch. They just thought, oh, it's time. Well, we should. Yeah, well, no, we should switch. Mm -hmm. Right, we should That's switch. They don't, but they will. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. Pediatricians are advising to switch. Yes, that's mm -hmm. very, mm -hmm. and and speak language. Yeah, that's not good. No. Mm -hmm. Very bizarre. Anyway, yeah, I just mm -hmm. think that's a, mm -hmm. I would hope that you would get, it would be great to have a well, good an, sample of them. It would be, yeah, the four kids that we have, though, they were, it's a little bit skewed at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Were none of them in the welfare group, immigrant families in the welfare group? Um, well, I, um, there, there, there was a, a lower SES family. Um, I don't, yeah. Oh, I was gonna say, no, I was going to ask you, but you said you were going to say but. Well, we, just, we didn't collect data on their income in that way. And actually, I don't think we had any family that was on social assistance except the one mom who lived with her mother. Um, and she actually wasn't really on social assistance. She was living with her mother with her young child. So, 
although she was probably collecting some. But she was in, in a way, she was in a middle um, income household with her mother. So um, she wasn't working herself? She wasn't no, working. she wasn't working, but the, there, there, there were, were means in the household. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, there, we did have lower income uh, 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 um, families in the sample. Uh, Al Carter, Alice Carter didn't have much qualitative stuff, right? It was mostly. Um, I just saw that. They they did a um, uh, yeah they did a this um, the lifter um, oh, yeah. play based assessment, um, and they did a, a a number of standardized measures. They did the ESCS, mm -hmm. so they've done some standardized, yeah. and they did some observational pieces. Yeah. On why the gains you said there were some small gains made in adult word count post. Yep. Why it wasn't maintained? Yeah, I would say they. I, I think they they need more. They um, they're really at a very beginning stage of understanding how to use these skills across their day. Mm -hmm. um, they might have understood um, how to use the skills as their child was at the particular developmental level while they were in the program, mm -hmm. but as the child moved on, maybe they didn't quite grasp um, how they could change their behavior to um, uh, uh, be consistent with what their child needed. So. Uh, but I would just say more. They needed more coaching. That would be my impression. Um, what Alice, Alice Carter actually, uh, well, Yoder presented at the SRCD last week on their data. And um, they have been in communication with the Hannon folk. And the, uh, what Alice said was that more than words won't look the same in a year. Um, they are making um, quite big changes with the program. Um, and actually, um, Elaine Weitzman, who was at ASHA, um, and we presented on the qualitative data um, last November in ASHA, and um, um, she came to our poster. We had lengthy discussion about um, what we'd found, and we gave her our... We really felt that what their also not doing in the More Than Words program is they don't have a very good understanding of A, what skills the parent ha parents have when they come into the program, and B, how well they've learned the skills when they exit the program. I mean, what we read in the research literature are studies that actually evaluate parent fidelity of the skills learned, but in the real world, um, there isn't really very much monitoring of how much parents learn these skills. Um, exceptions would be um, with a PRT program, um, in order to, um, for parents to move on to the next set of skills, they have to achieve 80% fidelity to move on to the next set of skills. So they've actually got a mechanism within that parent training to actually make sure their parents have those skills and then they can move on to the next set of skills. Hannon has no mechanism like that. It, um, the program is delivered, but there's really no counts on whether or not parents have those skills. So we um, shared with her our um, parent and clinician fidelity um, mm -hmm. questionnaire. Um, because I, um, and they were interested in that because they they think that is something that maybe they would be able to incorporate um, within the parent training piece. So um, they're interested, I think, in some feedback to how they can improve their program. Um, just wondering if um, one of the things that might have helped parents sustain the change in talking more, or whatever. Would you have shared any of this information with the parents in the study yeah. to say yeah. when you did these things, oh, yeah. we saw this yeah. happen? Actually, so, we did do that. Okay. I forgot to mention that. So um, uh, we gave the parents sort of little reports on um, that pretest data and the mid-period data mm -hmm. and the post. Mm -hmm. So they did have a little bit of an understanding. But... Um, 
it's a, I think it was a bit too numeric for them. It, um, it didn't really mean that much um, um, or, or even kind of intersect with the skills that they were being taught. Um, so I, I, and actually that's one of the things that Stephen Warren said in his paper, that's why we did it, um, when he looked at um, uh, the, the environments of kids with autism, he said maybe you know this could be used as a feedback mechanism for families. Mm -hmm. But we did that. We had a nice little, what we thought was a good knowledge translation of the information that we'd collected on the Lena. Um, but it didn't seem to have the impact that they were already getting all this information from Hannon and trying to incorporate that. And then they had all these numbers. <laughs> but I mean, one of the things that maybe was useful was they knew when they talked the most. So maybe they could actually think about um, increasing frequency during other periods of time during the day. But, but you know, the, I mean, a big problem with that program, mm -hmm. and, and this has always been an issue, is th that it does place this, I think, un undue, uh, but never mind, um, influence on getting parents to talk more which feels very unnatural to families, and they're not going to talk more unless they get reinforced for talking more by the kid. I mean, any good behaviorist knows if you want behavior to increase, over time it's got to meet with consistent reinforcement. And I think that that's one of the things that these families probably don't see, is an immediate impact. I talk more, look, my kid's immediately starting to vocalize more or talk back. Hmm. And that's, I mean, that's, that's what gets people hooked is I do more of the things that you said to do and look I see behavior change in my kid mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. there's not enough intensity right uh, uh, often for, for kids with autism that their behavior is going to change very quickly just because the parent is talking more or mm -hmm. being more contingent or or whatever there needs to be a, a, like a a quintupling of that. I mean, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm, like, it's mm -hmm. not just if you if I talk a little more, my kid will talk more. It's like I'm going to have to talk a lot more and play a lot more and do a lot more, and then I'm going to see some impact on the kid. That's what we know that from mm -hmm. early intervention that you've got to do a lot of the extra thing, not just a little more. And so I'm. I mean, I think that well, uh, but the Lena can the, could have potentially, if it had been that information had been delivered in a way, it might have been able to get at that some of the increased. But I'm saying, I'm saying, on a moment, you don't you don't do something for two or three weeks, and then someone tells you, oh, here's what uh, we've noticed in your right. data. Mm -hmm. What you you oh. have that feedback on a. Right. It's organic, right? Right. It's like every, when I, you know, today I notice that my kid's talking more because I'm talking more, not because somebody tells me over the last two weeks the kid's increased by 10%. Mm -hmm. I feel it as a reinforcer, as a contingent reinforcer on a, or on a moment to moment basis. You, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah, and I don't know that families get that feedback from doing something as simple as, and you know, I'm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not been an issue mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. Hannon mm -hmm. in general, not just more than words, but other, mm -hmm. right, all along, that mm -hmm. they can show change in parent behavior, but very few of the studies have showed remarkable endurance of that parent change and or remarkable well, no, change very, in no, child. No, very few of the studies have actually looked beyond um, the, the immediate, the, immediate um, the, the post at the training. So the, we really don't know very much about the, uh, the durability of, of the training. So I don't know about that yet. I would, to me, I think we don't know there. But, you yeah, um, know, but this is um, one of the things that I think is sort of appealing about um, this program for lots of service providers, though, it is uh, maybe cost effective. There's it's the uh, there's an idea behind it that it might be cost effective mm -hmm. um, uh, if say um, in places where there aren't services um, that you can provide something for families to do 
um, when there aren't interventionists in the community. But if it's not durable and the kids don't change, then you're wasting money with the cost-effective intervention. That's all I'm saying. I, I guess what I'm saying, when I taught more than words, I've been for a long time now, but I don't know how much we want to put on the amount of parents talking. I think a lot of it's about how to communicate with your child. Right. And, and that's yeah. not necessarily all the time verbal communication. No, and that's and actually... We've heard it about... Pausing. ...that base yeah. and pause and... Yeah, we've got to go. And, Bye. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And get that. So I don't, I don't know if... I agree with you, Pat, in terms of the need for intensity and that feedback, but I think sometimes that feedback mm -hmm. isn't vocal. No, it yeah. necessarily mm -hmm. communication in another way. We talk a lot about, you know, eye contact, joint attention, you know, oh, my kid looked at me and wanted the water on. Oh, they're communicating. You're not going to pick that up on me. Right. Right. No. And and actually, yeah. So in fact, for our engagement states, Karen, that's exactly what we were after. There, we were after more um, and higher engagement, which oftentimes was nonverbal. Yeah. Um, which uh, is what I mean. Mm -hmm. Some of the foundation you need for a lot of those mm -hmm. things is that yeah. let's not go jump right to the talking. Mm -hmm. Let's mm -hmm. let's ensure that there's communication. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also in terms of vocalization, some of it is just kind of typical development, you know. Mm -hmm. Changes increase because in also in other right. words you saw more variability even in the normal sample. Yeah. So how you measure like the adult words at the post, it was over one day or average of three days? What oh, actually think? that's a good point. We um, we realized when we did a little bit of pilot with the Lena, because there's so much variability in a household, you can imagine mm -hmm. a day when you're not at home on the weekend compared to a work day. So we um, uh, used the, the, there were three, um, three days in a row that the, we gave the Lena to the families. So we actually averaged those um, uh, scores for three days of taping, mm -hmm. so that we get a, got a better sense of the average of what was going on in a household. Yeah, because I think in terms of vocalization, you saw increase in vocalization of the kids. Yes, yeah. But this is maybe even like because there are stages that if they are developmentally at nine months, Maybe they are still kind of development, so you anyway without the problem. Oh, see absolutely. We have we can't attribute yeah. the child change at all to what happened with the program, yeah. but we can suggest that if there was this um, uh, parent and child change, it, yeah. it may have been associated. The most, kind of the yeah. Piece is the most yeah. Because that's a lot of the communication, the focus of the program. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Those videos were very important. Yeah. Um, all of the families that were um, part of, the, in, in Alberta, you can only get funding um, and receive services from one service provider. So unlike BC where families get a pot of money and they can choose things, is that right? Still, I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, in BC or in Alberta, you um, choose a service provider and the way that this service provider is um, uh, uh, their infant toddler program is working is they get the Hannon more than words program and then they engage the families in a more intensive intervention so they have an idea that they want some kind of um, parent understanding of this these language development activities and then they move into their behavior um, interventionists and they're using um, for that program the, the PRT model. Yes? I know people need to leave. All right. So I want to thank you a oh, whole bunch thank for doing you. this. And, uh, yeah.